in this quiet church in the heart of England. There's a curious object that bears witness to a book so influential it would help usher in centuries of religious intolerance. In 1570, the most important men in Elizabethan England, the Queen's Privy Council, made an unprecedented decision to put an unknown and gruesome work into every church in the country. This was Fox's Book of Martyrs, a graphically illustrated catalogue of the violent deaths of Protestants killed by Catholics. It joined two other 16th century tomes already in every English church, the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. This lectern is an enduring testimony to the easy familiarity that the common people of late 16th century England had with these books. Instead of just one ledge to hold a Bible, this has four sides. So it allowed the two volumes of Fox's Book of Martyrs to sit alongside the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. In the history of England, there are just a handful of works that have truly changed the soul of the nation. These books chained here are three of them. In this film, I'm going to tell the remarkable story of William Tyndale's Bible, Thomas Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer, and John Fox's Book of Martyrs. They're titles that today don't sound controversial, but in the 16th century, their words and phrases sparked revolt, were debated in Parliament, and eventually became the backdrop to English life for over four centuries. It's the book that people live and die to, and for that matter, live and love to. Played out against the backdrop of a Tudor dynasty at war with itself, it's a story of intrigue, changing fortunes, and three men who pursued their religious vision even in the face of their own destruction. This is an extraordinarily dangerous book, um, and Tyndale knows it. These were works that defined the most radical religious revolution England has ever known, the Reformation. Fox is literally rewriting history at this moment. In their pages, men believed lay the key to the salvation of their souls, making the difference between an eternity in heaven or hell. These are far more than works of religious literature. They're propaganda, poetry, manifestos of belief, in whose pages lie the story of a battle for the soul of a nation. The three men whose books would turn the nation against Catholicism paradoxically began life passionately devoted to Rome. William Tyndale, Thomas Cranmer and John Fox were all born within three decades of each other into a world dominated by the Catholic Church. And like everyone in the early 16th century, their lives had one focus, their eternal salvation. To that end, they would have said confession, done penance and most importantly, gone to mass the most sacred of all Catholic rituals, both then and now. And a moment where a miracle was believed to take place. One that had the power to save your soul. As the priest uttered the sacred Latin words, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was believed to take place again throughout eternity. the bread became quite literally his body, the wine his blood. It was known as transubstantiation. The mass in Latin was a ritual so sacred that it enabled the divine to break into the ordinary world. 
and once transformed, it was believed that even to glance upon this fragment of the transcendent was to be healed, protected, blessed. It was even processed around the streets so that ordinary people might have the chance to see the divine. In this world, the sacred and the secular were one, and the common language of power was Latin. A world where even to attempt to translate the Bible and the rituals of the church into English was an act of heresy, punishable by death. So I grew up in a Polish-Irish Roman Catholic household, and I have been to hundreds of masses in my time, but I've never sat through a full high church Latin mass with the incense, the chanting, the gold. It is incredibly seductive. But what it also made me realize as I'm watching the priests up there chant in a language that I can't understand is how difficult it must have been for ordinary people to access the spiritual. The idea that there are people up there who know, whereas down here are the people who don't. It was this divide, this wall of Latin, that the writings of Tyndale, Cranmer and Fox would tear down. From their words and phrases, the Church of England itself was moulded and its Protestant beliefs first expressed. And this battle for Britain's soul would begin with a book that would cost its creator his life. William Tyndale was just 12 years old when he arrived in Oxford. He attended Magdalen School and then Magdalen Hall, where he did his BA. Brought up in Gloucestershire, the son of cloth traders, he spent his childhood among farmers and merchants with the English babble of everyday conversations of the marketplace ringing in his ears. But here, at arguably the greatest university in the medieval world, the language of the classroom was Latin. Oxford was a bastion of traditional Catholic learning. Tyndale hated the dry and sterile way the Bible was studied in Oxford. The text was in Latin, and the emphasis was on the endless analysis of individual verses and passages, rather than a sense of the whole work. But during his time here, he heard rumors of a radical new approach. Stories of an obscure, inflammatory German friar were being whispered in the corridors of English power. His name was Luther, and in 1517, he'd launched an attack on the wealth and power of the Pope, an attack that had its basis in his studies of the Bible. Luther's message was devastatingly simple, but he believed men's eternal lives were at stake. In the Catholic Church, salvation was to be found in its rituals, practices that had been carefully moulded by popes and bishops down the centuries. But Luther disagreed. Luther claimed that the Bible says nothing about being saved through going to church or doing penance for sin. Salvation came from faith alone. So, the Catholic hierarchy and its practices, things like pilgrimage, penance, confession, were all redundant. And to prove it, he translated the Bible from Latin into German, so the common people could decide for themselves. For the Catholic hierarchy, this signaled the beginning of a crisis that had to be avoided at all costs. Their fear was chaos, moral disorder, and Luther's theories did plunge Europe into revolution. But for Tyndale, these ideas were the inspiration for what would drive the rest of his life, his determination to translate the Bible into English. 
in a furious argument with clergy in his home county of Gloucestershire, Tyndale made clear his subversive ambition. I defy the Pope and all his laws, he said, adding, if God spares me, I will cause the boy that driveth the plough to know more of scripture than thou dost. Tyndale's words caused rumours of heresy and he was forced to flee to London. In the 16th century, this was a city crawling with heretic hunters, keen to stamp out Lutheran sympathies. Those caught could be tried and tortured. And the king, Henry VIII, was himself a staunch Catholic. When Tyndale arrived here, Henry had already been on the throne for two decades. The king was fiercely opposed to Luther and had written a stinging attack on his ideas. This earned him the favour of the Pope, who rewarded him with the title Defender of the Faith. It was in this unlikely atmosphere that Tyndale sought a patron for his translation of the Bible. He went to see the Bishop of London, Cuthbert Tunstall, to try to get his support. But Tunstall hated Luther as much as the king did, and Tyndale's request was refused. It was a rebuff with potentially deadly consequences. And in 1524, Tyndale left England. From now on, his passion to translate the Bible was all-consuming. It was an obsession that would earn him some formidable enemies. King Henry VIII, the spies of the Holy Roman Emperor, and even the Pope himself. Enemies determined to do everything in their power to stop him. Tyndale's destination was Germany, Luther's home, and a place where he believed he would find the finance for his work. For the rest of his life, he would be a marked man. Tyndale spent the next 10 years on the run working 12 to 15 hours a day to complete his dangerous translation. In a Catholic continent, it was a task fraught with risk. As he traveled, he learned German so he could read Luther's translation of the Bible. He pored over the great humanist scholar Erasmus's New Testament in Greek, the language the text was originally written in. For two years, he was utterly absorbed. The result was a translation of the New Testament so brilliant that it would inspire even the lowliest ploughboy for the next 500 years. Thousands of copies of Tyndale's 1526 New Testament were printed, but only one complete copy still survives. Amazing to see this. Why is it so important? It, it doesn't look like much, does it? But this is, is very deliberately a small, discreet object because this, this is contraband. Um, you, you could end up being burnt at stake if you were caught with this thing. Mm. But I think this book, this actual book in front of us here is the most important printed book in the English language ever. Tyndale's words and phrases are ones that still echo down the centuries. In the twinkling of an eye, eat, drink and be merry. In the beginning was the word. They're expressions that have shaped the English language. But it wasn't the beauty of his prose that so inflamed Tyndale's adversaries. There's a series of particular word choices that Tyndale very deliberately makes, which are direct pointed attacks on the power of the, of the church establishment. So, for example, where Jesus says, and upon this rock I will build my... Church? 
that's the traditional view. But Tyndale translates that Greek word ecclesia as congregation, which is not an institution, not something headed by a pope, but a collection of people, a community. And so this is a, a, a direct attack on the idea of hierarchy and suggesting that all Christians stand equal before God. So it's about the body of the faithful making the church, not the hierarchy, not the bishops, the people. This is absolutely revolutionary, I think. It, it is. And if we look at the beginning of Mark's gospel, where Jesus is preaching, repent and believe the gospel, which to our eyes sounds you know, almost innocuous, mm. but the Latin the equivalent of that had traditionally been, in effect, to do penance, focused on confession to a priest and performing penance, rather than repentance as something that's, that's inward, that happens between the believer and God with no need for any intermediary. What is it that the Catholic hierarchy are so afraid of here? Well, on one level, they're, they're afraid because their entire institution is, is under direct attack, but it's threatening at a much deeper level. When you're telling people that there's no such thing as a church, there's only a congregation. When you're telling people that there's no such thing as sacramental penance, there's just sort of feeling sorry within your own heart, then you're threatening to lead people on a path to hell. So from the point of view of the hierarchy, who are responsible before God for the souls of the English people, this is something which is absolutely their responsibility to stop and to stop by any means necessary. Tyndale had unleashed the words of the New Testament so they could no longer be controlled. This small volume was about to undermine the foundations of an entire nation. In 1526, copies of Tyndale's New Testament began to be smuggled into England. Hidden illegally amongst ship's cargoes, his clandestine work was an instant underground bestseller. For the first time, the words of the New Testament were liberated for all to read. But whilst it was popular with ordinary people, for the Tudor establishment, it was of the devil. And it was at St. Paul's that the battle against Tyndale and his New Testament was most ferociously fought. Those caught with his translations faced a humiliating punishment. They were made to process through the city with copies of the New Testament hanging around their necks. And when they reached St. Paul's, all copies of Tyndale's work were set ablaze. In the face of such opposition to his work, Tyndale was unrepentant. But it was only a matter of time before his luck ran out. And it was in Belgium that he was finally caught by Catholic agents of the Holy Roman Emperor with King Henry's connivance. On the 6th of October, 1536, Tyndale was tried and condemned to burn to death for heresy. His final words were a plea for Henry to allow a Bible in English. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Tyndale died believing that he'd failed. His Bible in English, accessible to every person in the country, was still a far off dream. And yet even as he burnt, Tyndale's work had powerful secret supporters. As the man who pioneered the English Bible breathed his last, his words were about to take on a life of their own. It would fall to a quiet Cambridge don to help make Tyndale's dying wish a reality. Eight years before Tyndale's death, Thomas Cranmer was plucked from his life of obscurity and thrust onto the global stage. 
He was among a handful of Oxford and Cambridge scholars picked to work on compiling the arguments for Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. It was a task that would make him one of the most powerful men in England. For the first 40 years of his life, Cranmer had been a conservative Catholic, but as he began to work on Henry's annulment, his views began to shift. His task was to find a way to get Henry the divorce he wanted. His obstacle was the Pope who refused to grant it. Cranmer's solution was to search for evidence that would question the authority of the Pope to make such a decision. Cranmer pored over the history of church councils to see if legitimate decisions had ever been made outside Rome by bishops rather than the Pope. And he found they had. It brought him to a radical conclusion that it wasn't the Pope who should be the judge of what was or what was not God's will on earth. It was the monarch. Unsurprisingly, it was an idea with which Henry strongly agreed. And in 1533, he rewarded Cranmer by making him Archbishop of Canterbury. Cranmer's ingenious thinking not only informed Henry's divorce, but would also shape the future of the entire English church. It marked the beginning of a fundamental shift from an English church loyal to the Pope to a national one answerable to the King. And through Cranmer's promotion came the fulfilment of Tyndale's lifetime ambition, a Bible in English. In 1534, Cranmer commissioned 10 bishops to work on a New Testament in English, but they failed to deliver. Their translations were either inadequate or not completed at all. Cranmer was in despair. He said that the proposed Bishop's Bible wouldn't be completed until the day after Doomsday. He and Henry's right-hand man, Cromwell, were forced to do something of which Henry wouldn't approve, secretly rely on Tyndale's translations. The eventual result was the Great Bible, authorised by the King with a preface by Cranmer himself, but based closely on the unmentionable Tyndale, with only a few of his most explosive translations changed. In 1538, two years after Tyndale's death, a ruling was passed that this great Bible should be placed in every church. The first of the three books of the English Reformation was finally in the hands of the nation. But it would need more than just a Bible in English to transform the soul of England. Despite Henry's hatred of the Pope, the King and his people were still deeply attached to their Catholic rituals and beliefs. It would take a second radical work to turn the religious ideals sown in Tyndale's pages into a day-to-day -day reality. With Henry now the head of the church in England, he wasted no time in imposing his authority. In 1534, the great Catholic monasteries began to be dismantled. Unacceptable symbols of a church still loyal to the Pope. On the 3rd of December, 1538, Rivo, a 12th century Cistercian abbey, closed its doors for the last time. But the destruction of these powerhouses of prayer had a profound effect. One that formed the backdrop to Cramer's decision that a new prayer book in English was vital for the survival of the church in England. It wasn't just the lead roofs and stained glass windows that disappeared from these buildings. It was the constant round of monastic prayers and rituals. These monasteries were hubs of pilgrimage, where the laity came to ask for prayers. The monks here prayed eight offices a day from a breviary, that's their daily prayer book. So everything from matins through to vespers. These rituals formed the backbone of the religious life in England. 
If they were gone, something was needed to replace them. And it wasn't just the monasteries that were changing. During the 1530s, reforms were being passed. There were fewer holy days, an end to pilgrimages, and no cult of saints. All to reflect the shift away from Rome. These changes in religious structure and belief needed to be echoed in the worship of the church. Its prayers, its rituals, its creeds, all stemmed from an institution with the Pope at its head. A new liturgy to unite a new church in England, stripped of its popish practices, was absolutely vital. As the great monasteries fell silent, Cranmer began work on his Book of Common Prayer. It was in the winter of 1538, in the London Palace of the Archbishops of Canterbury, that Cranmer's believed to have begun the labour of love that would destroy him. It's amazing to think of Cranmer being here and wrestling with the book that would come to define him. We know he consulted a large number of different sources, like these, copies of the Sarum Rites. They're collections of the most common forms of worship in the Catholic Church in England, going back to the 11th century. But he also read the works of German Lutheran Protestants and even Spanish prayers in search of the perfect words and expressions to describe the important moments in life. Things like birth, death, marriage, the passing of the seasons, but most importantly, the new beliefs of the reformers in England. And at the heart of the work lay a ritual so sacred that to question it was to be burnt for heresy. In the last years of Henry's reign, English evangelicals were starting to interrogate the central right at the heart of Catholicism, the mass, and the idea of transubstantiation. These reformers shockingly denied the real presence of Christ's body, claiming that communion was merely a ritual of remembrance. Their views were so controversial, they were condemned to death. Cranmer stayed away from their arrests and examinations, perhaps because he secretly shared their heretical beliefs. Beliefs that would have cost him his life if he'd confessed them. And although he may well have been working on a Eucharist service with these new ideas at their heart, while Henry was alive, any ambitions he had to make them real were impossible. Despite his rejection of the Pope, King Henry was at heart traditionally Catholic. He believed in the real presence in the Latin Mass. He and his conservative bishops dealt ruthlessly with anyone who didn't share their religious views. It would take the death of the monarch who'd handed him power to enable Cranmer to realize his Protestant ambitions. And in 1547, his opportunity came. On the 28th of January, Henry died. His son, Edward, the first monarch ever to be raised a Protestant, was crowned aged only nine. With Henry dead, the remnants of Catholicism he'd clung to could begin to be dismantled. It was the moment for Cranmer to realize the religious revolution he'd waited for with his own prayer book at its heart. Within six months, all religious processions were banned. Worship no longer spilt onto England's streets. And in 1548, Cranmer finally began lobbying for his prayer book to replace all Catholic worship in England. But it wasn't straightforward. The church was split, with conservatives on one side and reformers on the other. The controversial issue of the Eucharist was even passionately debated for five days at the House of Lords. It was during these discussions that Cranmer, for the first time, publicly revealed beliefs he'd held private, namely that he no longer believed in the real presence at the Mass. Despite its lack of universal support, Cranmer got his way and an act was passed making the Book of Common Prayer compulsory in every church in England. 
Why was the Book of Common Prayer one of the most important books written in the English language? Well, the Book of Common Prayer provides an, a template for uh, experiencing, for practising religion in a completely different way. It states it, first of all, just if you look at the page here from the preface, uh, which was written by Cranmer, the reason for the book, he says, is that the service in this Church of England, these many years, he says, hath been read in Latin to the people which they understood not, so that they have heard with their ears only, and their hearts, spirit and mind have not been edified thereby. Now we might take that in terms of the difference between Latin and English simply, but what Cranmer's most interested in is the bit about in their heart, spirit and mind. He thinks that if you can't understand the service, you can't internalise it. And if you haven't internalised it, that's not proper religion. So he's trying to replace what he thinks of as being a religion which is uh, communal and perhaps learned by rote with something which is felt by every person in an individual way. With his work now complete, in 1549, the Archbishop unveiled his masterpiece. In the very place Tyndale's New Testament had been burned as heresy, now congregations could hear his words at the heart of a liturgy in their own tongue. This was a moment of triumph for Cranmer the culmination of years of planning, meticulous hard work, and the absolute conviction that in the words of this book lay the path to true salvation. The Book of Common Prayer still forms the basis of worship in Anglican churches around the world. Its words marking life, death, birth and marriage giving us phrases that are part of the bloodstream of our lives. To love and to cherish, lighten our darkness, ashes to ashes. And at its heart was the new rite of communion. No longer a moment of miracle, but a service of remembrance. The book was a practical manifesto of a religious revolution now placed in every church. But the reaction to Cranmer's great work wasn't celebration, but violent revolt. From the early summer of 1549, the compulsory introduction of Cranmer's new book to replace the well-loved Latin mass provoked outrage. Across the counties of Devon and Cornwall, men rose up and began to march in bloody battle for the liturgy of England. The rebellion began in the small Devon village of Samford Courtney. The parish priest waited until the final date allowed by the government before he introduced the new prayer book, but his parishioners rose up. They forced him to wear the old popish attire, and to sayeth mass and all such services as in times past accustomed. In their makeshift camps, rebel groups began to gather and burn copies of the offending work. In July, they laid siege to Exeter. For these intensely loyal Catholics, the demand to use the new prayer book wasn't just an attack on long-cherished beliefs. It was the final provocation for a people who felt that the rituals and customs that held the fabric of their lives together were being ripped apart. And for many, the power of the mass lay in the mystery of its language. Take that away, and the ritual was merely words. Being able to read the Bible in English was one thing, but the enforced introduction of a new service in English was quite another. News of the uprising was slow to reach London, but when it did, the reprisals were devastating. 
On the 3rd of August, royal forces descended on the rebel stronghold of Clist St. Mary. The village was set alight and the soldiers ordered to kill their captives. The army were utterly ruthless. Ordinary men armed with nothing more than pitchforks were crushed by thousands of English soldiers, backed up by mercenaries from Germany, Italy and Albania. Here, in one of the bloodiest moments of the rebellion, in just 10 minutes, 900 men had their throats slit. It was the beginning of the end for the rebels. By August, the rebellion was all but over. Nearly 4,000 men lost their lives in the rebellion. Men prepared to die for the sake of a book. But Cranmer's vision to reject England's thousand-year Catholic past was abruptly halted. In 1553, the Protestant boy king Edward contracted tuberculosis and within months he was dead. The night before his funeral, his body was carried into Westminster Abbey. Around him gathered his court. Reformers who knew their dreams of a Protestant future were now in jeopardy. The heir to the throne was Mary, the daughter of Henry and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. As a committed Catholic, she had every reason to hate all that her half-brother and his advisers stood for. On that August night, as the Archbishop stood by the body of the young king he'd invested so much in, he knew that his time was running out. He had humiliated the new queen's mother by granting Henry a divorce from her. He destroyed the religion that she loved so much and even declared Mary illegitimate. He knew the time would come when Catherine of Aragon's daughter would exact a terrible revenge. With Mary's return, England went into sharp reverse. She began a dramatic reintroduction of the Catholic rituals that Cranmer had begun to tear apart. And within a month of her coronation, Latin Mass was once more heard in churches across the land. Cranmer was furious and privately wrote condemning this insult to the Eucharist. But his letter was leaked and copies spread across London before he was ready to make his views known. He made the best of a terrible situation. Instead of denying the words he'd written, he published more copies. In it, he denounced the Latin mass as of the devil's devising. And he defended his own work, saying it was more pure and according to God's word than any that hath been used in England this thousand years. For Mary's government, Cranmer's words were incendiary. Only months after Edward's death, he was taken to the Tower of London. He would never be a free man again. It was in Oxford that Cranmer faced his dramatic end. As he waited for his execution, from his prison window, he was forced to watch the procession of the Blessed Sacrament. The ceremonies he had banned, Mary Tudor had reinstated. On a rainy morning in March, he was led to the university church to make his final statement. As he processed up the aisle with the sound of the Catholic liturgy in his ears, to those watching, Cranmer appeared to be a man defeated. The religious zealot who had spearheaded the Reformation had descended into a spiral of loneliness, fear and doubt. In this fragile state, he signed no less than six dramatic recantations of everything he had worked his whole life to achieve.
Before Cranmer spoke, the Provost of Eton, Henry Cole, sent by Queen Mary, gave a sermon in which he listed the reasons for Cranmer's death. Reasons he read from a statement Cranmer himself had signed only three days before. In front of a packed church, Cole explained why, despite having repented of his sins, Cranmer still had to burn for his heresies. And the charges which he himself admitted being guilty of were read out masterminding the divorce of Henry VIII from Catherine of Aragon, and the denial of the real presence in the mass, the central belief at the heart of the book he thrust on every church in England, and an act which he himself admitted had put other souls in jeopardy. In his statement, he begged the forgiveness of the Pope and Queen Mary. As Cole finished, the waiting crowds would have been on tenterhooks as the once all-powerful Archbishop started to speak. Cranmer began by asking the assembled masses to pray for his forgiveness, but he enigmatically added, yet one thing grieveth my conscience more than all the rest, whereof, God willing, I intend to speak more hereafter. The listening officials had a copy of what he was expected to say, that it was his untrue books and writings contrary to the truth of God's word that so troubled him. But it suddenly became clear this was not Cranmer's intention at all. Instead, he said, the writing that was contrary to the truth I thought in my heart and was written for fear of death consisted of all such papers I have written and signed since my degradation. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy, as Antichrist, with all his false doctrines. And as for the sacrament, I believe as I have taught in my book. Cranmer could barely be heard in the commotion that followed. He was pulled from the stage and dragged through the streets to the stake, amid scenes of chaos. As the wood was lit, the fallen archbishop stretched out his hand in one final defiant gesture. For as much as my hand offended, Writing contrary to my heart, my hand shall first be punished. Although he knew his final hours were a triumph for the Protestant cause, he must have feared that his hopes for a reformed England would die with him. Little did he know his death was just the beginning. The dream he died for would not only become a reality, but within a decade, every English church would echo with the words of the liturgy in which he so passionately believed. His prayer book would not only survive, but go on to define the soul of a nation for over 400 years. As the flames of Mary's Catholic passions enveloped England, News of her burnings travelled across Europe to the ears of a man in exile. A man whose work would help ensure the future fate of both Tyndale and Cranmer's works. His name was John Fox. And although today he's largely forgotten, his work, the Book of Martyrs, would transform England. It so savagely turned the country against Catholicism that just over a century after it was published, laws were passed which ensured that no English monarch was allowed to be Catholic again. Fox had been an Oxford Don, but he was caught up with the ideas of the Reformation and forced to leave the university. When Mary came to the throne, Fox knew he was in danger. So he and his heavily pregnant wife fled for the continent. And it was here in Basel where the seeds for his revolutionary work were sown. The city was a safe Protestant stronghold in a continent still largely under Catholic control. And Fox, penniless and full of zeal for the new faith, became a proofreader for a famous printer, Johannes Operinus. 
Operinus' printing house still exists. And it was in these rooms that John Fox's imagination was fired by ideas that would become the foundation for his magnum opus. Operinus's printing press was publishing the most important books by reformer scholars. So Fox found himself at the heart of a secret and sophisticated network of Protestants from across the continent. They were risking their lives to smuggle out heretical documents, letters from reformers in prison, and news of the latest executions. It was an atmosphere of dangerous innovation. One of the most popular types of books being printed were martyrologies. These were gruesome accounts of those brutally killed for their faith throughout history. These Protestant martyrologies addressed the most difficult intellectual challenge the reformers faced as they fought for their survival in Catholic Europe. The problem for Fox and the other Protestant visionaries around him was that those being killed were not seen as heroes or martyrs in Catholic England, but as heretics, as political dissidents, so dangerously wrong in their beliefs that they were jeopardizing not only their own souls, but the spiritual health of the nation. Fox and the reformers knew that in order for Protestantism to win out in England, they had to prove that far from being radical heretics, these men were in fact the true church, and that it was Catholicism which had perverted the Christian message and was leading people astray. Fox's task to prove this was nothing less than a rewriting of a thousand years of English history showing how her millennium as a Catholic country was a heretical aberration, and how her people now had the chance to reject this false faith and embrace the true church. And in 1558, Fox finally saw his opportunity with the death of Mary Tudor, leaving Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth, as her heir. Elizabeth was Protestant, it was the moment Fox had been waiting for. It was a chance for a martyrology he would produce to influence the thinking not just of a queen, but of an entire nation. Now he just had to turn his vision into a reality. In 1559, Fox returned to England with a mission to write a martyrology in English of Protestants who'd suffered under the Catholic Church, from early Christianity to the reigns of the Tudors. And within weeks of arriving in London, he met the man who would help him make his book one of the most popular in English history, the publisher John Day, a passionate reformer and with a genius for PR. A work of such enormous scale was a huge financial risk for him but he immediately saw the potential of Fox's ambitious plans to turn the lives of their friends and fellow reformers burnt as heretics into tales of religious heroism. From the minute Fox set foot back on English soil, he and Day raced to complete the work as soon as it was physically possible. 18 months later, the first edition was finally finished. It was the most complicated and technically demanding book ever printed in England, and in its fullest manifestation was six times the length of the Bible. And I've come to Fox's old Oxford college, Magdalen, to see it. So exciting to see this particular book. It's huge. <laughs> it is. <laughs> This is the first English edition of John Fox's Acts and Monuments, otherwise known as the Book of Martyrs. Not only that, it's the copy that John Fox dedicated and gave to Magdalen College, Oxford. And then we can see down at the bottom, John Fox's signature. The book was full of Fox's detailed accounts of the deaths of Protestants. But what made it an instant success was a rather more tabloid idea of days. 
In a masterstroke, he took the financial risk of funding woodcuts of the martyrs being killed in ingenious ways. Ensuring that an even largely illiterate population would understand the message they were trying to convey. So this particular one, what's that showing? So this is three women who were burned at the stake in Guernsey. And what you can't help but see is that the lady in the middle is giving birth to a child. Yeah, there's a, there's a child flying out of yes. her ripped abdomen. This is Peritine Massey with her mother and her sister. Long story short, they're charged with heresy and therefore burned at the stake. But what presumably was not taken into account because she didn't tell the authorities, Peritine is pregnant. So she gives birth in the flames. Oh. But as grisly as that is, it gets worse. Mm. What happens afterwards is that someone rushes in, grabs that baby to save it. He's then told promptly, throw it back in. Oh my goodness. So this is, this is really powerful imagery, communicating with illiterate people Absolutely. in a way that, that visually they can understand. It tells a story in and of itself. So you see the pained look on the mother's face because she's giving birth at the stake. And that's understandable, but what you get with the other two, with her mother and her sister, is a very stoic look on their face and their hands are raised mm. in prayer, indicating that even though they're in the pains of death, these are clearly martyrs because they are not suffering the pains of death. They know they are going to a better place. And so you contrast those faces with people like here, the Catholic authorities, who are quite ugly, and this chap here in particular, you can see he's laughing at mm. what's happening. So what you've got is this juxtaposition of good godly Protestants and a physical manifestation of the evil within with the Catholics. Mm. And that's one of the really innovative things that Fox and the printer do in this, is that whilst the text is there for those who can read, in many instances, you don't have to read. You can read the image and nobody would really done that to this extent before with such graphic pictures. In fact, the book was far more than a macabre record of Catholic tyranny. It was a profoundly ideological piece of Protestant propaganda. And it's the ornate frontispiece that epitomizes what Fox and Day were trying to prove. Okay, so here we have the title page. On the left and on the right, you see these opposing images. And what it's setting up right from the beginning is, these are the Protestants, these are the true church, these are the Catholics, these are the false church. So what's happening? Bottom on the right, we have a creature preaching to a not very captivated group of people, it has to be said. Not a book in sight. It's about rosaries, it's about processions, and it's about a priest who is thinking more about himself than preaching to his flock. And just sneaking into the shot there is uh, a little devil Cheeky with his tongue that. out and his hand ready to clutch those souls mm. because it then moves into a more sinister image. We have, again, quite ugly men kneeling and the priest here is elevating the host. And so they are representing transubstantiation here. They are representing that moment when body and blood are a real thing, not a memorial, as the Protestants would have said. Right above them, that elevated host moves into some more devils who are clutching souls, and they are looking in distress, clearly because they are not saved. Put that in comparison to the left. We have a very handsome preacher with a fine beard. <laughs> Everybody looks riveted in what he's saying, and some appear to be following, they're following in books. Very Protestant image. And we move from that straight up to watch those martyrs at stake. Yep. There's a direct correlation between the two. If you go to goodly preaching, and if you are burned at the stake as a heretic, you're not, because you are going to go and join these people up here with their beautiful crowns and their trumpets and clearly representing those souls who have been saved. Fox is literally rewriting history at this moment, saying the Protestants aren't the heretics, the Protestants are the saved. Fox had visualized a new ideology. Now he just needed it to spread. But for that, he had to secure the backing of the queen. 
seven years after the first edition, Fox and Day launched a new version of the Book of Martyrs. One that would make it a household name. It was more comprehensive, with three times as many woodcuts. And Day again had a stroke of genius to make exclusive gift copies for influential members of the Elizabethan regime. This one belonged to Queen Elizabeth's Archbishop, Matthew Parker. What makes it so exceptional is that every single image has been individually hand-painted. In this epic, the new queen and her advisers saw a unique opportunity, a work that had the potential to persuade the entire nation to reject Catholicism once and for all. It was a gift that didn't go unrewarded. In 1570, the Queen's Privy Council ordered the Archbishops of York, Canterbury and London to acquire copies of Fox that could be distributed to parish churches across the country. The Book of Martyrs was to act as a Protestant warning against the tyranny and barbarism of Catholics and persuade a people worn down by decades of religious conflict to accept a Protestant rule. And it worked. Fox was an instant success. It's easy to see why this book was so persuasive. The woodcuts are utterly compelling. And the images even circulated on their own. They were displayed in taverns and in people's homes. It's no surprise that in its wake, anti-Catholicism became one of the defining traits of the English, a people who were once utterly devoted to Rome. Within a generation, Catholicism had been transformed from being the only religion in England to being the work of the devil. As the Book of Martyrs was chained to lecterns across England, it joined the English Bible and the reintroduced Book of Common Prayer. In 1559, Elizabeth had approved a revised version of Cranmer's liturgy, overturning Mary's ban. Now, the once most controversial books in England formed the backbone of English lives. Fox lived until old age and would see four editions of his work in his lifetime alone. And it was in his pages the reputations of Tyndale and Cranmer were redeemed. The humiliating deaths of the authors of these two incredible pieces of literature are among those that are most celebrated in Fox's Book of Martyrs. He reinvents them. They're not heretics anymore. Now, they're religious pioneers. But there was a high price for their redemption, Fox's demonization of all Catholics, ensuring that for the next 300 years, they were excluded from all positions of power, fined if they refused to worship in Protestant churches, and often treated with utmost suspicion. These works have a mixed legacy, the liberation of the word of God, the democratization of Christianity, the cost, religious intolerance. But you can't help but stand in awe at how three books were able to so entirely change the soul of a nation within just decades. From this moment, it was William Tyndale's New Testament that the people of England heard every Sunday it was Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer that would echo in their ears from their very first breath to their last. And it was Fox's Book of Martyrs that would act as a constant reminder of the terrible fate that would befall them if they gave up these hard-won beliefs and returned to England's bloody Catholic past.